excursions into the African bush can be a lot of fun, but not always, and not always for everyone. This story is titled, The Fainting New Zealander. These are true tales of my African adventures. May this inspire you, deter you, caution you, and above all, entertain you. Visitors to Africa sometimes become champions of the bushveld. Some don't, after a baptism of fire. I met Rod at school. His father, a tradesman, was drawn from New Zealand to Africa to ply his trade. I decided to treat Rod to a bushveld adventure and organized a fun-filled weekend to the north of Johannesburg. <clears throat> Tents, in our earlier days, were certainly not high-tech. A critter-proof, zip-up, waterproof tent with built-in ground sheet complemented by thermal sleeping bags were as foreign then as a cell phone, a laptop and a buck barama. Ugh. <laughs> and Barack Obama. <laughs> okay. Tents in our earlier days were certainly not high-tech. A critter-proof zip-up waterproof tent with built-in ground sheet complemented by thermal sleeping bags were as foreign then as a cell phone, a laptop and Barack Obama. We had a pup tent, a pathetic one or at a stretch two-man tent, semi-prehistoric in design, of canvas material, not impervious to water, no undersheet, two large flaps for a door and heavy. It was the technology of the day. We arrived at our destination somewhere between Narbworm Sprate and beyond. We headed off the main road to some distant hills. It was December, the month of heat and storms. The bush felt had been dry for several weeks and the heat was oppressive. On this hot day the drought was to be broken spectacularly. Clouds rolled in from the east as we marched through the parched landscape. With each moment they became darker and more menacing. We reached the foothills and climbed some two or three hundred meters up the slope. Thunder rolled across the felt as lightning began to erupt from the dark. Ominous God-driven clouds enveloped the region. We were midgets under this brewing storm which was larger than the boldest imagination. The storm was about to impose its authority on all earthbound life. As the heavens opened up, we enshrouded ourselves with the canvas tent and sat huddled together, hungry, cold and afraid as millions of cubic meters of water descended on the thirsty earth and our ill-prepared bodies. Torrents of water raced down the slope, driving silt, debris and water against, under and around us. A more miserable sight you could not imagine. It was pitch black as we endured nature's wrath. We slept a little in the dying hours of the night and shivered our way into the dawn, greeting the sun with gratitude. So hot was the day that we soon dried out and dismissed our dismal introduction to the weekend. It was steamy in the heat of the day as we crossed the hills and descended into a valley of dense bush on the east side. We found an ideal campsite. A clearing in the bush in a valley with a stream nearby now gently flowing after the storm. This was a rocky terrain. Huge boulders, rocks, stones all around us, the location remote. We pitched our primitive tent and explored. Some time before dusk we made a fire. A simple meal was cooked in our camping pots and we chatted happily and fulfilled. At this time, close to nightfall, the earth began to vibrate with life. We weren't quite prepared for the events that followed. A new storm was brewing, not a rainstorm, but a storm of nocturnal creatures impatient for the night. A dry period in the bushveld 
causes a retreat when the spell is broken by a deluge of rain. Every nocturnal creature emerges rejoicing to drink, to feast and pursue primal urges with no regard for unwitting visitors. Having consumed our basic meal, we lit a candle in the tent at dusk and prepared our blankets to sleep out the night. Sleep? What sleep? As darkness fell, the first of our visitors appeared. I heard a scuttling sound and a massive scorpion moved into the tent. Rod was not amused. I used our wooden tent peck mallet to persuade our visitor to scuttle outside. Then a centipede, a purple, black, 10 or 12 centimeter creature with huge pincers and venom glands moved through the tent at some speed. I have never been fond of centipedes, especially when looking at their toxic biting apparatus, when camping in the bush, especially when sleeping on the ground. Next, a pitter-patter of multiple feet on the canvas tent, a silhouette of a baboon spider, the South African version of a tarantula. Then more sounds on the tent and more hairy silhouettes, a baboon spider, another baboon spider, hunting spiders, a couple of centipedes, other insects, beautifully displayed as in the window of a horror toy shop, lit by the candle shining through the white canvas tent. Then more scorpions in the tent, I don't mean two or three, but eight or ten. Then more baboon spiders, one, two, three. Then more hunting spiders, then other insects. We paid no attention to the masses of other insects, but focused on the nightmarish ones. We were in a mad entomologist's bush lab. The spiders, scorpions and centipedes were feasting. The candle illumined tent had drawn a zillion insects and these predators were after them. At some point I took a more severe approach to dealing with the large and more menacing insects and arachnids entering the tent to save Rod from a mental breakdown of some type. I used our tent peg mallet to bludgeon any threat to death as it moved towards Rod. I resorted this to prevent Rod running off, screaming into the night, never to be seen again. No one could have foreseen the next event. A large baboon spider slipped into the tent and moved towards Rod. The spider now nearly under him, I struck wildly with the large mallet, a last chance hit before it was on or under his quivering white-lipped body. The swing of the mallet caught Rod on his knee. I suppose you've seen how a knee jerks the lower leg up when a doctor taps you to test some reflex or the other. Well, I hit him with the force of a blacksmith's hammer putting the finishing touches to the flat end of a three-meter crowbar. Up went Rod with his superb reflex, taking the tent with him, looking, I am sure, like a whirling dervish in the bushveld in full dress. I am not sure if his yell was from pain or fear of the spiders on the tent, which he was now wearing on his ample body. It took a confused, frantic 30 minutes to re-pitch the tent and light the candle again. Soon the spiders, centipedes, scorpions and the rest were back to torture Rod. I was at my wit's end. This certainly couldn't go on all night. Help was, however, at hand in a most unexpected form. Without warning, there was movement outside the tent. A loud scuffle, then a grunt. The grunts came closer. One of our pots was overturned, clanging in the crisp silence. I became a little concerned. Could this be a leopard? The creature was now just outside the tent flaps. Give me the spade, I whispered to Rod. It was my only likely weapon. The spiders, etc., were now of no immediate concern. There was a new and larger menace. The creature was now still and quiet at the door of the tent. I could not stand the suspense. I steadied the spade, ready to thrust a sharp-edged blow into the face of the animal. 
I slowly reached forward and then quickly drew one flap of the tent's door aside. A large male baboon glared at us, then barked a piercing bark, baring his teeth as he rose up in surprise and bewilderment at the human ape before him. Rod was now silent, not speechless, but out for the count. This final event had proved too much for him and he now lay on his back deeply unconscious. He had fainted. The baboons left. At last I could sleep. The insects and arachnids had free reign now. We were dead to their movements. Rod was never to accompany me again on such an outing. I can't say who was more relieved, he or I.